welcoming uh, all of you, members of the Architects Association and distinguished guests. Uh, this last panel deals uh, with a very uh, uh, important and uh, uh, intrinsic element, uh, the relationship between architecture and society. Uh, not only that, uh, the, role, the architect's role and how uh, he relates with the society uh, will be the subject of our discussion. Uh, ever since shaping uh, mankind's shelter and defining how he lives, uh, whether in an urban setting or a rural setting, out of necessity or out of uh, human projections, uh, the relationship or the critical role the architect has uh, with the society has always been of uh, interest uh, and uh, to discuss this uh, uh, relationship, and uh, I have guests here, uh, all distinguished in uh, their respective fields. Uh, Dr. Zagaya Chernet, uh, to my left, to immediate left, uh, is, has, has a degree in architecture from the former uh, Department of Architecture and Town Planning of the Addis Ababa University. Uh, followed that up with his master's uh, at the um, Institute of Technology in Rurki, India, it's master's in architecture. And of course, just currently uh, finished his PhD uh, in Germany. Uh, he has been uh, uh, active in the academic as well as the practice, uh, notably teaching at the current Adama, uh, who had been a former teacher at the Adama Institute of Technology, the former Nazareth Technical College, uh, also at the Ethiopian Institute of Architecture, Building Construction and City Development, uh, a visiting professor at ETH Zurich, uh, and uh, with his practice, he has a renowned office, the Office for Architecture and Design and Urban Studies. Notable works include the Hyperdice, commonly known as the Momona Hotel on Boli Road, and of course, uh, the South Star International Hotel, which is a landmark in Awasa, south of Ethiopia. Um, next to Dr. Zegeye, I have Mr. the distinguished Mr. Mfeti Morojele, uh, an architect from South Africa. He has an uh, architectural practice uh, MA, named MMA Design Studios. Uh, which had been operating in South Africa and uh, regional uh, areas since 1995, uh, focusing on architecture, urban regeneration, design, and research. Uh, the office has uh, renowned projects, uh, most notably the Freedom Park Museum in Pan-African Architecture, uh, which, is complete, which has been uh, awarded the uh, Award for Merit by the Pretoria Institute of Architects. Uh, and of course, for architects in Ethiopia, uh, he is the architect uh, behind the South African Embassy in collaboration with RAS Architects. Uh, Mr. Emmanuel Tashome, the third panelist, uh, is an architect by training uh, with his bachelor's degree at the Addis Ababa University, followed that up with his master's at the University of Leuven in Belgium. Uh, Mr. Emmanuel um, had been one of the uh, uh, partners behind Beta Architects, successful architectural practice, and of course uh, he has now followed that up uh, with his own practice, ATK Building Investments, focusing on architecture, project management, and uh, areas related to construction. Uh, and apart from that, he's also a very good colleague and uh, a respected mentor at the university, uh, where he is a lecturer at the Chair of Project Management in the EIABC. Gentlemen, welcome. So I'll just uh, kick this off uh, with a question, architecture and uh, society. Uh, the architect relates with society. The architect is part of society. The architect tries to inspire, tries to influence, and is also influenced by uh, matters that happen in the society. So, uh, how do you see this relationship? How do you understand the architect's role? Mr. Infeti, yes. it's in our norm, in our culture, guests usually speak first. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think our cultures are the same. We also torture our visitors to start first. <laughs> Uh, but thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here where I consider my second home. 
because of the work I've been doing here and some of my historical roots in Addis Ababa as well. So the Nastel link. Um, the question you raise obviously is a very uh, big question and it's a question that has different answers I think at different times in a society's history. Um, as you know coming from, from South Africa we our society that has gone through a lot of change in the recent past 20 years. Um, and it is a change where um, one really understood the role of an architect in propping up a particular idea of society. Um, and how once we got our liberation, it raised a whole lot of new questions about the role of architecture in society and the architects. So I think that experience has really given us the benefit of almost going back to first principles of what it is to be an architect and what do we mean by society. Um, so in the notes I, I wrote here, I just broke down a few ideas about what it is to be an architect and a few notes about what do we mean when we talk about society. So I'll just start quickly just to maybe provoke some, some, some discussion. Um, firstly, as architects, we are trained in a very specific way, which no other discipline is trained in. Um, we're trained both in, in, in the creative fields, in the artistic fields, in human behavior and sociology, and yet we're also trained in the sciences and in the technical fields. Um, and this is a very... Um, unique kind of training that we have. The ability to synthesize different uh, issues, different problems, and to be solution driven. Because we don't just analyze, we come up with solutions. So I would say, as architects, we are number one, designers. Number two, we are cultural workers. And number three, I would say we are technologists. Now what do I mean by that? I mean, as designers, we solve problems. Some of those problems might be related to spatial practices. Some of those problems might be related to processes. So the process of putting a project together, the process of getting funding, the process of uh, getting the different players to work together is part of design. It's part of, it's part of what we do. Uh, and therefore we, we, we are designers first and foremost. Um, cultural workers, I think, as architects and as spatial practitioners, basically what we're doing is trying to create society's ideal environment of how they believe they should live. So it means, in a sense, we are at the crux of culture, which means we have to almost go backwards to understand our heritage and where we come from in order to kind of project where we're going to into the future. Uh, and as our societies transform politically, culturally, socially, we are almost at the forefront of trying to vision and imagine for society what that future could be, based on an understanding of our past and our history. So we have a very critical role in terms of understanding our historical and our uh, heritage um, and our identity, who we are as a people, where we come from, what aspirations do we have? Where do we want to see ourselves in the future? And then finally, as, as technologists or engineers, we are really talking about how do we build the craft of building. And really how we build has an impact on, again, on society. It has an impact on our economy, on our ability to create jobs, um, and our ability to to impart skills. So the decisions we take about what materials we use on a building project, what technologies we use, what techniques we use, these have a wider impact on the economy and on the society in which, in which we live. So I think those are the three aspects of, of an architect which I think would be interesting to, to kind of discuss um, in, terms of, in terms of our role. And then secondly, when we talk about society, um, if you break down society, just for the sake of the discussion, society, we have government as part of a big 
player in society. You have business and the act of being busy and busyness. Uh, and then we have the community. And these three poles of society each pull us in different directions as architects. Um, and fourthly and most importantly now is our fourth client, if you like, which is the, the non-human society. In other words, our environment, uh, the, the flora, the fauna, this has become our client in a sense. So in terms of our clients, we have four different clients who pull us in different directions. Um, and yeah, I guess when we come maybe to a next round of discussion, we can then look at what the impact of each different one uh, has on, on the architect with those different roles that I've, I've mentioned. Same question, right? Yeah, is she? Um, first, I, 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 I think I, I, I would like to, to thank you for a nice introduction and having this chance to speak. And then also I have to say that uh, our works in our office are not my works alone. It's a, a work, a product of also my partners. So the credit goes also for them. If there is anything good, it means that it's, a, it's a group work. And third, as I have been, like you said, I have been yeah, a teacher for long in the university or universities. Again, the credit goes, if I do anything good or bad, the credit goes for my teachers. So some of them have been here and also to my students who have been constant inspiration for my life. Having said that one, I come back to your question about architects. But in the topic you said architecture and society. And if you say architects and society or architects role in society, well, of course if we, I don't like classification. I usually claim to be a human being first. And then, then, then looking myself as an architect, very difficult concept. Nevertheless, it is a definition as, that is given by structure, law, government, education, whatever. So, yeah, for the sake of this discussion, allow me to call myself architect. And, and this categorization is based on naturally, based on the things that I'm trained to do. So the question would be, what am I doing? Or what am I trained for? In simple terms, I would say that I am trained, educated, to do architecture. And then the question becomes, then what is architecture? It's a very classical, complex question that we cannot handle probably in this very brief panel discussion. And naturally, after living this long and then teaching and talking and thinking about architecture, I think I am entitled to have my own definition. And I define architecture as a structuring of the physical space for life to, to, to flourish. This is the way I relate my work and the way I, I understand myself in acting in a society in space and time. Structuring the physical environmental space for life to flourish. I don't like the term building. I like space. I don't like the categorization of architecture in scale, whereby architects are making buildings while urban designers are designing urban. I don't like that categorization, so I simply flow in this particular subject or object called space. So I stand by this particular definition of mine, which I say that architecture is a structuring of the physical environmental space for life to flourish. I'm trying to connect it with the society. So we have at least three key words in this definition that I have, which is structuring, space, and life. The flourishment being a qualitative issue, so I don't want to go there, but at least we have these three issues. Structuring is, of course, an act, which is very interesting that architecture is something to do with work. In German, I don't know, there is somebody um, who can help me in, 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 in the definition of this word work in German. If Dirk is here, probably he would help me. But it is something to do with something that we do. That architecture is not an abstract way of thinking only, but it is related to do things, work, producing things, some things in this expanse of reality or expanse of space. So structuring refers to our action based on thinking as well as also doing things in our hands, in our minds. 
But what is more interesting to me to think and to reflect on is the two terms, space and life. Space, of course, that is the substance, in my view, the most precious resource that all living things share in this strange planet. It's a substance that these crazy people called architects are trained to structure. Space, for me, again, is the basic resource with time for life to happen. So I always say that space and time are the two, the two gifts that we have in order to define life. And if we take space as this substance that we are entitled or at least give responsibility to, to, to do with or to, to work with, and then we structure it for life to flourish, then the issue comes into understanding and the proper understanding of what life is. Of course, like, like my colleague was saying, he was expanding to all life forms these days, but classically we refer life as an individual and collective formations, and in the, in the individual and collective formations. And when we, when we interpolate and expand the individual reality of existence and life into a collective dimension, then we have a term called society. So to say, if we think of this collective dimension, then architecture becomes the embodiment of that collective reality in the object called space. So architecture becomes the embodiment of that collective existence called a society. In simple terms, we can call it a city, but in me, at least, at least for me, I still refer that that is what I call architecture. The embodiment whereby underneath, under, underneath we have this attempt of structuring the physical space for life to flourish both individually and collectively. But we know and we have been learning a lot that humanity is not a singular life form, it is primarily a society. It, just to say that then architects are burdened, I would say, to manage and to structure the very basic resource that life would exist in and flourish in. And, you know, thinking these things loudly to myself would shiver, uh, make me shiver actually and think seriously that indeed we are challenged and presented this responsibility of managing, structuring the only resource in which life form exists, including even dreams. Dreams also demand a physical, special experience to happen. Society, the, the, the last term, I know I'm taking time, but society, the last term, I'm only talking about space, but society, if it is a collective structure of life, is again, if one wants to understand it, so I know that this is quite a complex reality and phenomena. I would only say that this is a dynamic phenomena which is influenced by so many forces. Now, like my colleague was saying, that society for which we structure space happens to be super dynamic, which is influenced by time and so many events, including the physical environment, other forces, and technology, and thinking also. So yes, we are structuring the space for life to happen, and that, that life is a function of societal, or society, or collectivity. And that collectivity is influenced by so many factors that makes us to be the most burdened, in my view, the most burdened professionals or disciplinary responsibility that we assume among all the other professions. And probably afterwards, I'll come back to, to go deeper into the dimensions that we are confronted with. Aman. Thank you very much, uh, Brooke. Um, I think your question was, uh, what is the role of the architect uh, in society? Uh, I know Zagaye has, uh, Dr. Zagaye has started uh, with a very risky thing to define or try to define architecture. I will leave it to him. <laughs> of course, and that's why I leave it to you. 
because I myself uh, I'm not sure uh, if architecture has been used as an instrument for life to flourish, uh, which is what Dr. Zagaye kind of led architecture to be. Uh, architecture in history we have seen, and I may be the youngest in this panel, but from what I've seen and read, architecture has been used uh, not only for life to flourish, but the rivers also uh, in history. So I'm not sure how one can, at a particular time in history, define architecture. So it has to be, uh, it has become a, collect, a, a moving target for me. But then uh, I, I'm so young, <laughs> so to say. Uh, and probably the future will have, uh, uh, will have better better uh, definitions for it. But having said that, going back to your question of uh, the role of the architect in society, uh, I think that question is, and of course we, we wrote it as a subtitle sub, uh, for our team this year, uh, it's a question that needs a context. Uh, I, the architect today cannot have a universal role. An architect practicing in uh, in Berlin may have a different role to the architect practicing in Sao Paulo and to that of us practicing here. Uh, so I also can't dare to give the role of the architect a universal definition. But if you ask me what should the role of an Ethiopian architect be in the Ethiopian context, which I'm more familiar with, I may, I may have a couple of things to say. Uh, a very humble opinion is the architect has to be the servant of the society. Uh, we're, we're graced by the opportunity to, to think three-dimensionally, to think with the end in mind, the ability to shape our contexts, uh, against uh, against the wish of the society, and I'll I'll come back to uh, how society should also be understood. So that's the service uh, we owe the society. So in today's uh, uh, in today's context here in our country, uh, we are bound as a servant to the society. But then the question also comes, when you say society, are you talking about the client that comes to your office with the money bag? Or are you talking about the people that don't come with the money bag? Uh, very often, uh, and I've seen it also in my practice uh, and also colleagues, we tend to see society as the client that comes with the money bag the client that signs the check, the client that says jump, and we answer how high. And of course, um, I'm not immune from this, none of us are, but especially here, because we can't claim we have done much to society that is not willing to pay. Uh, I, I saw a very interesting documentary the other day by, uh, by a Colombian architect uh, well, many of you probably are more familiar uh, about his work than myself, Oscar Mendez, uh, who was a very surprising individual for me, simply because he set off one day and said, we should start to make building material with plastic, recycling plastic. And by this, he was able to deliver affordable housing decent, affordable housing, at the same time uh, protecting the environment. So for me, this kind of people are, uh, are a big challenge, not only because he's an architect, and maybe I share some of his knowledge, but because they have gone beyond thinking that the society is just the person who signs his check. So he has found his check, or his payments, I should say, 
in serving society by being uh, an innovator of a, of a material that helps to create housing, affordable, decent housing, and also uh, serving the environment on his own. So I cannot dare to say that uh, this, should, this is the role of the architect, the Ethiopian architect in the Ethiopian context. But I think the role should be more than just being a servant to the person who comes and signs the check. It should be a collective role of a, of a society that necessarily is not ready to pay for you, for your services. Let me leave it at that for now. Uh, definitions of uh, the architect's role, uh, his relationship with the society, uh, you have, uh, um, in all of you gentlemen, tried to enshrine the uh, role of the architect or the classic role or what he should play. But we are seeing, you know, with the rapid development in Africa, you know, context is uh, in more areas similar, uh, with a huge challenge uh, from uh, developers, uh, the government, the environment is at stake. Uh, is the architect uh, actually playing a relevant role? Uh, because uh, in various contexts, it appears as if the architect is marginalized. The architect is nothing is uh, appearing to become nothing more than a surface renderer. Some clients, some uh, developers even claim we just need you to select the color of the building. We don't need you for more than that. While design briefs programs are decided by powers beyond the architect. So uh, how does he fit in in this rapid development in an area where uh, uh, he finds himself in a chaotic situation? Uh, the definitions of the role of the architect, gentlemen just pointed out, hardly fits into the picture in the current context. I would very much encourage you to reflect in that context, in that scenario, because where are we? We are hardly in that picture. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll try and reflect a little bit on my own experience practicing um, in a situation, as you say, of, of <laughs> rapid development like we have in Africa. Uh, in some instances, that can actually be a bonus for the architect because uh, where you have a fluid situation, uh, you can actually find ways of operating beyond the limits of an architect who takes a client's brief and carries out a project but where you actually go further up the food chain to actually begin to define projects and, 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 and initiate projects. So, for example, in where, where, where we operate in South Africa, sometimes you find that a lot of the local authorities have budgets which are given to them by national government, but in order for them to access that money, they have to develop business plans for different projects. And a lot of these municipalities don't have the capacity to, to access those funds because they don't know how to develop projects that can, can access money, whether it's for donors or from government or whatever. So our role sometimes has been to actually go and initiate the project um, and including getting the funding. Um, so it's almost like you're moving up the food chain and our role is expanding beyond uh, just getting a project your understanding of government policy, understanding of programs, understanding of where budgets are. Um, one can then almost initiate uh, your own projects. Um, where you have a need, you understand there's a need in society here. There's people who want to fulfill that need and you're almost uh, joining the dots or making connections within society um, in order to, to start the project. So I think that's, that's one possible area where I think the role of the architect does expand in the context of development. That we become more than just uh, recipients of briefs, but we actually initiate projects. And I would encourage us both in our training at universities and in our practice that we look beyond waiting for that phone call about a project, 
but we actually expand our knowledge into society to say, here's a particular need, this particular area, there's such a particular problem, how do we solve that? Yes, so the question was, is the architect marginalized uh, by whom? Uh, it's quite difficult to ask again. <clears throat> I mean, in my view, again, irrelevance, irrelevance comes from the way you perceive yourself, the way you give a position in a particular structured society. Again, I am self-criticizing. Uh, ourselves and myself it's nobody is giving us or is expected to give us a position in this dynamic social reality uh, because at least ideally nobody owns the system however <coughs> one has to reposition oneself through understanding the mechanism of the system one of, uh, in my view, again, in my assessment, again, I'm just putting forward my opinion. One of the challenges that we have in our time, particularly in our country, and then I would also expand it a little bit further, in our time in the world, particularly in the societies of architects, that we have defined ourselves <coughs> and cornered ourselves by a certain iron greed kind of definitions. We have given or assume responsibilities so tight that we allow ourselves to be manipulated and controlled and in times marginalized. So primarily I would say that it is our own problem because we have repositioned ourselves to be easily marginalized. Why? <clears throat> primarily because it is the way we see the service of architecture. Like I said, again I challenge Emmanuel by saying if I define myself define, you know, the term, define myself in a certain box. And then when that box is not, or, or, or I would say when that box was found to be irrelevant, I cannot stand in that box and cry why the other people define me as irrelevant. Because they define irrelevance in the center of their own measurements and value system. The point is, we, in my view, we lack a skill, not only our schools and our education, but also I have a chance to, to teach in many universities, at least as a guest, in schools of architecture and discourse of architecture. We're playing very old, and then we lack the capacity to read the dynamics of societies and find a way to respond to that. We are trying to respond to a system which does not demand our responses. I, I, I tell you an example, particularly taking a curriculum of our university for so long, that we were trained uh, primarily, and thanks to our, our teachers who have gone out of their way to teach us reality, but we were trained, while well, I was a student at least, in the curriculum, which was easily and simply imported from probably the modernist time of Europe. I'm talking uh, 20 years ago, I was trained and taught with a curriculum which was developed in the 1920s. And trained, developed by primarily the European modernists. And naturally, after being trained five years on a closed campus, with all the histories of history in Europe and in whatever you think a history of architecture exists. Yeah, yeah, I credit Fasil who introduced one course called Ethiopian Architecture. Otherwise, we have taken so many courses of history of architecture, starting from Egypt. And then I remember when we crossed our doorsteps of the university after five years, we found a different reality. We were not prepared for. Because we were trained, at least trained, I'm not saying again the term education here, yeah? we were trained to face another contextual reality, that's what uh, Aman was mentioning. And when we stepped out, because we were not ready for that particular reality, it's very easy for us to get marginalized. 
But as any other survivalist would think and reimagine himself, we ended up in criticizing the reality or actually, uh, let's say, categorizing the reality and, and, and insulting the society as if that the society is not ready for us. Who the hell are we in this place that we expect the society to be ready for us and then expect the red carpet for us to walk and function in that society? The problem is that we were not ready to read the reality and find ways to respond to it. That's what we say since 2009 when we try to reorganize our institute. We say primarily the skill that architects need to have is a capacity to read a phenomena or a phenomenon and the capacity to respond to it. So their creativity lies in response, responding to reality and their education, enlightenment lies in the capacity to read the society. So I say, if we place ourselves in a very wrong context, then we have to redefine ourselves and try to find ourselves uh, relevant enough in that particular context. So I would say, yes, there are global forces, local forces, which are playing beyond our capacities. But again, it would remain to be our responsibility to reposition ourselves, not to define ourselves, but to reposition ourselves by having the key qualities and capacities, but actually, or particularly, intellectual capacities, to function in a given reality. So it is my responsibility, that is what I say, it is my responsibility to define why I do what I do. If I expect somebody to tell me why, <clears throat> the very why of my existence, the very why of my actions, then I'm not yet evolved enough intellectually. So I say, that is why I say, in, in the definition of architecture that I have, I say, I give to myself and I share to my friends, I do architecture. Why? Because I have a reason. Because I have something which I call it life to flourish. And pro-life it means. So I know the why. So in that instance, I don't define myself, but I open up myself by literally putting myself in a particular context which, which, which demands my response. So in my, again, personal philosophy, that the architect has to reposition himself in, in, in finding a position to respond to a particular context. This demands him of a continuous repositioning and capacity to read reality. It is naive to expect reality to consume us. It is wise, again it's my opinion, to assume or develop a capacity to read reality and find a way to respond to it. Then in this respect, I wouldn't be surprised in the current settings of architectural education in many universities, even leading universities in the world, that we are caging people and then distancing young people from reality into a certain very classical positions of understanding of architecture. My friend was calling, for example, the substance or the reality or the phenomenon and this reality of environmental challenges, social justice, political realities, and all these kind of stuff are becoming and taking serious roots in this social structure. In the classical periods, of course, you have the bourgeois and then you have like you say, even now you have the capitalist, but come on, come back to reality of our country where we have 85% of rural people. And I don't know how many percent of the, urban, the urbanites can have the bag, of, the bag of money to come to your office. If you narrow down your context into a 0.5% of a society, you are allowing yourself to be, to be stepped over. So the gap lies in understanding and articulately define, or at least identify, where you want to act and how you want to respond. Uh, I think uh, this issue of repositioning uh, is, a, is a common denominator. Uh, you, you asked, is, is the architect relevant in today's context? Uh, 
I hope it is, he is or she is. But for sure I know and, and I feel uh, as an architect here that uh, I am at a crossroad. And I feel many of our colleagues practicing here are at a crossroad uh, to decide whether they want to reposition themselves or not. Whether they want to create systems, understand systems, whether they want to go up the value chain, the food chain, or they want to stay there and wait for the client's phone call. I think here in Addis or Ethiopia in general, we architects are in a very uh, bold crossroad. Uh, we can decide to be irrelevant. And I feel some have already decided that. And our cities are justifications of that. When one reads Addis uh, and asks the question, uh, what's happening or what's going on, especially to another architect, if an architect is asking another architect coming into Addis uh, about what we are doing with our city, he's already telling us that we have become irrelevant because our cities are our works. Uh, the way we practice uh, architecture already tells us how we are looking at the irrelevant road. I don't want to say we are already on the road because I still see hope and especially because we are, all, we are also working on the education side of it, changing people to think or to reposition themselves. But the practice I think and I'm scared by saying this, is, is really becoming, uh, at a, at a, is, is really at a dangerous crossroad of becoming irrelevant and maybe even reduced to someone who signs drawings. Uh, recently on, a, on another panel discussion, a very senior uh, friend of ours was saying, uh, most of the projects here remind me, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was the end of an exhibition or in the middle of the exhibition, this panel was being organized. So this person was saying, the, the, most of the panels here <coughs> remind me of the uh, engagement of foreign architects in the 1960s. So he, he was hinting and I completely agree with him, that we Ethiopian architects have, are becoming irrelevant to the, the questions that our society is raising. And at times, we, uh, the society is actually uh, going out to get these solutions. So, um, the repositioning aspect of our, of our thoughts we can't blame our training, in fact, because our training gives us those, those skills. But it's about us identifying ourselves. And as Agiye said, once the box is removed, you have to search for it and uh, get a new box. So I, I, I think we have to go up and down the value chain to create our projects. We have to immediately uh, step up and increase our skills. Uh, or look for new skills that will continue to make us relevant, especially in a context where 85% of the population cannot sign, or I mean, maybe 99% of our population cannot sign our checks. We have to create our own checks because we need to get paid, of course, but we need to find systems. We need to work our, our way around, uh, just, uh, around just the clients that are coming to our, to our offices if that helps <laughs> to close it, yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, most of you are architects in the audience. What's your take on this? Are we relevant? Are we becoming irrelevant? We are definitely at the crossroads. We have to start inspecting, looking out ourselves. So I would open up the floor for the audience to reflect a bit. I'll take three, Fasil goes one, 
Athnatios goes as two and Tasfa Mariam in the back at three. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I think this, this panel was the most uh, exciting in a way because uh, it was really, I could, I could sense the, the, the emotion, the heat behind this discussion. Well, um, architects, we as architects, I think we are part of society and uh, we, need, we have a lot of responsibilities. But are we conscious about our responsibility, really? I mean, uh, Emmanuel was talking about uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the, our role as professionals employed by a client because whatever we do, at the end there should be a building and there, there should be somebody to pay for it and so on. This makes, of course, our responsibility highly market-dependent, capitalism-dependent, and so on. So in that way, we, we find ourselves categorized. But are we ready or are we willing to, uh, to limit ourselves in this box? I think if we are talking about society and our relevance to society, then we have to look beyond. I think Zagaye mentioned the change in education. We have seen change in that that uh, students, young people start to study the, the reality outside. And their reality is the city, the city that we live in, the city that we affect. And mind you, we are one of the most dangerous people when it comes to destroying our city. You know, that, that's a very, very serious thing. So the more conscious, the more responsible we become, I think the cities will, be, will become better. But unfortunately, we look, we have a very, very narrow understanding and reaction to this. Because every time we get a, a project, it's our plot. We don't even think the impact that we have. But do not get discouraged because architects worldwide, look at the, the star architects. They are not necessarily the most responsible people. Uh, some 10 years ago in England, they made a research what architects think about society, whether the opinion of society is in their priority list. You will not be surprised. It was not even number six. The priority was how good the building looks like aesthetically. Unfortunately, we have become an image society that we look at pictures, images. This is what captivates us. We are bombarded with images. And whoever does the most outrageous, the most unlikely kind of image gets the biggest mark on the architectural scale. But is that really what we are for? Especially as African architects, we have a huge responsibility. We can improve our environment. But do not get mistaken. We do not have to overestimate our position because there are bigger forces which come into play. We can only help to affect it. We can contribute our part to make it better. Unfortunately, we are not playing that enough because we are not aware of our responsibility. We are not trained to look that way. We are not uh, somehow environment, uh, landscape, uh, poverty, social conscious. These things are around us and we, we simply pretend that we are, it's not part of our life. Of course, in every client that comes, you don't talk about poverty because I think the next he will show you the door, of course. But there are so many ways that we can, I think our friend from, uh, from South Africa was saying, we can also be proactive. Of course, we are paid people, but sometimes let's Let's use some of our time to bring in our creativity to influence what goes on in our city. Let's put some time for that. Let's put some part of our resources in order to, because we are endowed with this skill and understanding which is unique, which is unique. Nobody has this combination of artistic, technical, and social conscious. The social, I, as I said earlier, is questionable. But we can try, we can educate ourselves and then let or make things better. We have some examples around the world, even though very rare, very, very, very limited, we can also learn from that and make an impact. 
So our responsibility to society is not something that should only be limited to our, only with our responsibility to the client. Because the minute we do a building, the client can pay it, but the building will be there staring at us every day, ourselves included. So we are making an impact on the environment of the collective. And this is a huge responsibility. Thank you. Uh, my issue was, with, will deal with competency. Uh, that's the issue I would like to raise. And hopefully with time, if we can get some reflection from the panelists, it would be good. Um, as Atofasil was speaking, I was reflecting on looking at life as, as a boat that has a, an anchor. Uh, you know, when we park a boat or a ship, we have an anchor that we set down. And I think that usually works under shallow waters, not deep waters. So when we take our, our knowledge or our understanding of what we know about architecture and we go to the deeper water where our anchor will not hold us down or will not keep us stable, uh, what would be the role of the individual competency with regards to whether to confirm or conform to society's rules and regulations or to play a different role of leadership, so to speak. If we have time, if I could get some sort of reflection from, from the panelists later on, I just wanted to raise that question as a discussion point. Thank you. Uh, actually, this is a never lasting question. Always we question whether we are relevant in our practice, you know, whether we are, we are contributing to the betterment of the society or the environment, this is, uh, we always question actually, while we draw, while we really construct. I have a position, uh, although I agree with uh, the gayest definition, because we have to uh, really help structure, modify the environment, creating a space for a purpose for the betterment of life. But we should be judged, you know, our relevance should be judged with our intention, with our purpose than the result or the product. Why I'm saying this, uh, because the result is actually, you know, the result done by many actors. So that challenge also have a purpose or a good intention to serve the society, to, 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 to change uh, the environment uh, to, to a better uh, world. It will be, a co uh, it will be uh, compromised or affected by a lot of uh, actors. So I, I know I have a purpose to respond to the, con the contextual reality that reality has not only, we might say, is sometimes societal, cultural, there is also a political reality, there is a physical, environmental reality. I should be lucky, you know, responding to this context the way I wanted it to be. So, I should be judged, you know, as an architect, I say I'm, I'm really relevant, I'm really, doing fine. Why I'm saying this, I judge myself always with my intention. I believe my purpose, my intention is not to make a drawings for a certain building and get money. My intention is you know, to do something out of that project, although it could be a response for the individual, but when that building is planted in a certain urban environment, I am responding to that urban, climatic situation, economic situation, whatever, whatever. So, if that my purpose is, my intention is to really do something good for, for the society, or I, I generally say to the context, responding to the context, I do what I can. So, I should be a good negotiator, doing what I can in that line, doing what I can in that purpose. But the result could be compromised somehow. Or if I am lucky, I might uh, get a sweet uh, response from uh, some of uh, 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 the context, or some, sometimes it's, it's a very bitter uh, response. So it's up to us you know, to mix, 
to try to negotiate, you know, to really uh, go to that purpose, to that, that, that intention. So, as always, you know, as, as Zagaye, Dr. Zagaye said, uh, we end up, you know, complaining, you know, this is not a good reality. You know, the political is, uh, purpose or policy is like this, you know, the client is not educated, uh, the land is uh, too narrow or uh, small. You know, always there is a solution, but the solution, that solution is a mix. So if I see, if, if uh, one has to see, you know, in this situation, the purpose is very important. The intention is very important than the result, which is uh, really compromised by many factors. Thank you. Can I take one opinion? I know I'm pressed for time, but I can't pass the opportunity in such an electrified environment. Gentlemen, the third row. It's a lot, but my question is simple. Uh, I don't think to leave the society's responsibility or a design for the architect. It's not just a, a simple issue, but uh, the decision makers of our society or our world are actually do play a lot of part. And uh, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, if, if someone has a kid and he, he wants to take him out, out in the green field to have uh, something, you know, in Ethiopia, or oh no, in Addis Ababa case, somehow things have changed quite a lot uh, since the past. So basically, our decision makers, um, if they have kids, you know, you know, you gotta see things in a kid level, you know, what the kid need in the society somehow. Our decision makers have more or less marginalized the society. They use the kid, uh, the, the old, um, totally forgotten. Uh, if you ask me, what our uh, architect's role uh, in the, the new railway train we have. Somehow we are cut out or somehow it doesn't reflect our socio-economic. So to me, the decision makers are not playing their part. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, different points reflected, uh, starting with Fasil, uh, where the world is in bombarded with images. Uh, and um, uh, making it difficult for uh, uh, the architect's role and um, his responsibilities also masked in a certain way. Uh, Atnatius raised about deep uh, waters where uh, it would be difficult to anchor the architect himself, anchoring himself in a defined position. And then, of course, Tasfamaria also raised on the uh, possibility of negotiating, adapting to realities. As a closing remark uh, from your experiences, uh, uh, would you capitalize on what you already started? Architects, it's definitely at the crossroads. Uh, you are uh, trying to recognize this from different angles. So as a closing remark, I would encourage you uh, from whichever panelist to to give his opinion? I think uh, Atnatius asked a very relevant question. Uh, I know I have been uh, very uh, emotional about this when we have been discussing with others, but I think the only way uh, forward for the Ethiopian architect in Ethiopia is going back to the times of Michelangelo. And by this I mean becoming uh, the, the everything. The architect becoming uh, or increasing his competences, I should say, in every realm. Managing the client as Michelangelo used to manage uh, all these uh, commissioners, managing the contractors or becoming one himself, managing our suppliers. I mean, how many of us actually recommend a supplier to produce a material? Of course, we now hear about a lot of industrialization and manufacturing opportunities in Ethiopia. But have we even, I mean, it's a challenge also for myself, but most of you here, have we given a different dimension of a wall block 
to a block pro producer. I mean, as simple as that. The smallest element, building element in our, in our buildings. So I, how I see the architect uh, at, at this particular crossroad going forward is really going back to the days of the master builder. Becoming the designer, the client maybe even, by managing his client, by negotiating with his client, managing uh, the interests of society, because sometimes the client does not come with a very clear brief. Sometimes it's a, it's, it's a group of people coming in with a different uh, interest and not just taking the interest of the powerful voice in that group, but trying to find a middle ground among these people. Uh, managing our fellow professionals, sometimes knowing better about their profession, uh, at least the uh, analytical component. Uh, and furthermore, knowing better to ho how to put our designs together. If, and, 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 and I totally agree, this may not be the solution for other countries, maybe some, but, but for us at this time and age, I think it's very critical to increase our competences to reposition ourselves, gain more skills, more knowledge, go back to school if necessary. A different school, not just architecture school. Maybe we need to know about economics. Maybe we have to sit down with a sociologist and educate ourselves on how people think, how we should read our society. We should start to read our society in a different way. That's my opinion. So if we start to do those things, we can influence our decision makers. And they won't use us as tools anymore. We can influence our clients to give them better projects that not only respond to their economic appetites, but also to the people coming and using their properties. Maybe even venturing out into developing our own properties. Uh, we've been speaking with, uh, with a very good African colleague, colleague uh, from Nigeria, uh, who is the vice, the, pre the past president of, uh, of the UIA of the, sorry, AUA, who was telling us uh, two years ago that we should start to become our own clients maybe. And maybe show examples of how a better product can be created for the society. Housing, I mean, you know this is a dire uh, program uh, in, in, in Ethiopia. But can we claim as architects, as a body of architects that we have contributed enough. I know there has been uh, great contributions by some of our colleagues here, but how can we claim that we have given time to understand these several factors around delivering a home to the most unfortunate in our cities? Let's forget about the home. The small public toilet on a street corner. So, you know, this is just a challenge which I'm also posing for myself. But I think at this crossroad, these are the questions we have to ask ourselves if we want to continue the future decades and become relevant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, each time I'm sitting in a group like this, I always come away feeling quite positive about the passion that we have as a group of people. Um, because wherever we go, we are preaching to the converted. Nobody's saying, forget what you're talking about. I'm here to make my money and you know, live my comfortable life. So we are a committed profession. And what we've been talking about now and the passion that we hear, it reinforces that we do care about society beyond ourselves. And I think that's a positive thing, a positive place to start from. Um, I think we, we battle with the question of relevance. Um, and I think there are ways in which we can make ourselves more relevant. I think primarily if we continue dialogues like this, it's the building blocks to create a culture. So beyond just being architects, we're beginning to create a culture through disseminating information, through having series of talks amongst colleagues, um, and through sharing ideas and I've got this problem, how do I deal with that? Eventually we become a, a voice within the society and that voice then expands into society. And ours is quite easy because our work is visual and it's easy for people to understand. It's easy for us to make a demonstration 
You know, it's not abstract theories that we're talking about, but they're realities. And a lot of those realities are becoming more and more urgent in our cities as there's more contestation for space. We see it in Addis, we see it in Johannesburg, we see it all over that the, the urgency, of, which is about contestation for space in our cities is becoming more urgent. And therefore our relevance is going to become more and more. As long as we, we continue to, to have these forums where we can begin to lobby and create voices. So I, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm heartened by the passion and by the commitment. And I think um, the possibility for us becoming relevant lies in the collective culture that we have. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I, 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 I don't have any pessimism when it comes to the relevance of architects as far as two things keep on existing. One, the physical space. To life. As far as these two things exist, they need, they demand the presence of a skilled and informed mind with an intention of nurturing life so that it can structure the space. Of course, we know that this is contested these days, particularly in this extremely rapidly urbanized, I mean, globalizing world and commercializing world, whereby we hear again and again uh, in the previous panels also, whereby the market is becoming the dictator of the fashions and trends of life. It, I'm not naive not to realize the presence of these kinds of forces, not even the patterns of spatial structures these days are, like Tesfa Mariam was quoting, affected and, and dictated by the market. We know that now politics has become simply easily subjected to the forces of the market, particularly the international market. We realize that all these forces exist. However, these two things still exist. The substance called space and the phenomena called life. What demands, like I said before, is my capacity to read this complex reality and identify uh, and, and articulate the way I respond to. So I am an optimist. That is why I, I still keep my position in the school, teaching the young people uh, that there is a hope and a place for them to function in the society. But of course, when it comes to society like this, there is a larger risk, particularly in a socio-cultural landscape like Ethiopia, to be overrun very easily, and then to find little traces of your visions and intentions, like uh, Tesfam Mariam was mentioning, or Atnatius was saying, the deep waters. So here I, I recommend in navigating in these deep waters, what we have to understand, I mean, this is very tough for architects because most of us, including myself, probably are quite individualists. And I think we have to realize that the sea that we are navigating is deep and it, re it requires additional hands. So my humble prescription would be in order to keep relevant, I think, in my view at least, we have to have three things. One, updating ourselves in the capacity of reading by having such kinds of conferences, which is not seriously our culture. Debates, discussions, which would help us to understand reality better. Um, I think we can use the infrastructure of the school or any other places to inform ourselves in in giving us potentials or maximizing our capacities to read reality. So we have to expand discussions, discourses, debates, so that we articulate our positions and also we craft out our repositionings. One is that one. The other one is 
we cannot handle the reality. We cannot find ways. I cannot say we cannot, but I would say that we will find it so tough to act alone. So I think it would be better, like we say that, you know, things are getting complicated. We know that through history, society, the structure, the influences, the factors are multiplying. So we cannot play the master, master builder nowadays, probably. I'm not arguing against you, but at least what we can do is we can regroup ourselves and form small groups. Azizan trying to claim a lone position, uh, a master of all kind of position, we can complement each other by creating small groups. That's why we started even teaching design in a group in the school. In the school. So that we always tell the students that you have at least three resources to learn from. The primary resource is your colleague. Because he has a life, he speaks, he talks, he has dreams, he occupies space. So you have to know how to negotiate with your colleague in order to have a discourse about architecture. In an attempt also to teach them how to negotiate one another and how to complement one another in thinking. So as far as we are expanding complexities in reality, we need to expand our capacities by duplicating and then also creating small groups. So I would say that the practice of architecture has to recognize these challenges and complexities and has to recreate itself by little groups. It's not only here, but probably in South Africa, I don't know, but in Europe or in North America, it is becoming very rare to find a single man office. Or, uh, sorry, Emmanuel, a Michelangelo kind of uh, position. I understand your position, but say you cannot do it now because it's too complicated. So what you do is that be five Michelangelos. One can be good in construction management. One can be good in client management. The other can be good in understanding the sciences. And all these kind of things can come together to form a sail which is which is strong enough to navigate in this deep sea. The third one which I would like to recommend is to use such an organization, an association. Emmanuel and a colleague of, of mine earlier speaking about the big force. Let's say the players, including the market and the political forces, which we usually excuse ourselves because of their, their yeah, scary positions and scary stature, naturally. We cannot force them and, or confront them. However, we have to devise, uh, you know, I'm not an, an expert, I'm a simple teacher and I would like to remain to be a teacher. I cannot make a good campaigner. Naturally, I would be thrown into jail next day. <laughs> but I, 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 would, I, would, I would promote the idea that, that there must be a system that we create together in order to promote these ideas about the structuring of spaces. And the vehicle that we have is the association. I was the general secretary of the association once, with Aman was, was also there, Zeleka was our president. I, 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 I confess that I was the lousy general secretary, I know. But it was very difficult to mobilize people. And people are extremely locked behind their offices and their individual businesses. And it's very bit difficult to bring them together. It's really great to see all of you here. But this is a vehicle through which we can campaign. We can present ourselves. We can display the opportunities that we offer for the betterment of life in this societal structure. I think like Fasi was saying that there is no association or body of society better than architects equipped with so many qualities and tools, like I say, that we have the tool of visual language. It's not to seduce people, but at least to convince people to translate and transmit our ideas very easily. So I think we have to explore more these kind of bodies that we have built. Uh, very recently, probably most, I think all of you know, that the, the government is campaigning for 8,000 small towns in four years. Now it's only four years remaining. 8,000 new towns in four years, building them. I don't know how many of us are somehow participating in this campaign. 
I'm not, I'm not pro or against it, but in the realization or even in the discussion of this reality. It's unfolding in front of us that landscapes are changing, what I refer to as a space. Landscapes are changing. Society is being re reorganized. Economies are being transformed. And all these things are happening. And also culture, which we boast quite often to be the master of its embodiment, is also being transformed. How, where, who are doing this? We don't know. Yeah, it's challenging, it's painful in a way. In my lifetime, such a huge transformation is happening, which is primarily a physical, spatial, cultural transformation, and then I don't have a stake in it, both intellectually and also professionally. That is quite, quite uh, intimidating. So, I mean, picking up reality, reading reality, responding to that reality, Individually, if individually we're weak, like Atnatius was claiming, then we have to keep ourselves like, like, uh, like Aman was saying. If not, we have to reorganize ourselves in our strategies, be it in a group, as architects group, or be it in a society like AEA. And we have to reorganize ourselves in such terms and missions. Of course, there, are so many, there can be so many other possibilities and vehicles. In such mechanisms, probably we can reposition ourselves. But what drives us is the intention that we have as a society, the betterment and the flourishment of life as to my intentions. Having said this, I think, I think we have to be a little bit harsh on ourselves, a little bit, and assess our positions to take further steps in adapting some of not, so, so to say, prescribed positions or solutions, but at least we have to keep on discussing to even identify further possibilities in, in repositioning ourselves in space and time. But, like I said, I remain to declare myself an optimist that Africa is the next venue which demands architects much more than any other continent in this planet. It was very interesting to have this discussion and reflection from uh, three distinguished professionals. Uh, I, I must add, uh, just in front of you, uh, that we, we really have to congratulate uh, them for reflecting uh, uh, honestly and deeply from the heart and uh, from experience. Uh, and they also uh, instigated this thought-provoking discussion. I'm sure we want to continue, but uh, we are short on time. So, uh, uh, Dr. Zageya, Mr. Infeli, and Mr. Amanuel, I would like to thank you very much for taking your time and reflecting deeply from the heart. Audience, a round of applause.